all right one of one of uh what we're going to do today is um we're going to revisit the very last thing that we worked on on tuesday and 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 actually just redo what we did because again that was at the end of class and it happened pretty quickly so i don't expect necessarily just to hear something for five minutes that'll be um immediately clear in fact i don't expect for you to just hear things and them to be immediately clear. You, you know, when you try to put them into practice, that's when it will become clear. So, um, one thing that I would suggest doing is um, take, like, for example, the, the thing I did today and try to recreate the pages that I create. All right, I'm just going to make a real simple page uh, that has a list of contacts, I guess it was, from our example last time. I'm going to go through a, a handful of steps. And you can go in and uh, um, try to repeat it, all right? And that's a good way, um, good way to make sure that you really understood it. Um, it's like, you know, it's like learning any skill, uh, you know, learning how to golf, you know. Someone can tell me how to hit a perfect drive, and I can say, oh, yeah, I know how to do that. You keep your arm straight, you keep your wrists like this, you take it back. But that doesn't mean I know how to do it. Yeah. Pardon me? The booty out, okay. Uh, uh, well, maybe that was my, maybe that's why I could never hit a good drive, right? Uh, but um, you know, to, to understand and, and to, to like hear the words and, and all that is one thing, but to be able to put it into practice is is another. So uh, I would encourage you to experiment and try these things. Just try to do what I did in lecture as a good way to uh, to kind of practice. Um, then we're going to talk about a problem that um, we're going to go over the next several weeks in class, probably, I'd imagine. We'll at least go on this for, for a few weeks. We might actually spend a lot of time on this. Um, we're going to build something sort of from the ground up, and we'll talk about the problem. And we'll do parts of it together, and parts of it uh, I might assign like as group activities or, or whatever. Um, I'll just see how it goes. But first, let me pull down the example that I had last time. This, by the way, is roughly the halfway part of the semester between this week and next week because we have 15 weeks of classes, eight weeks, I guess 16 weeks if you include finals week, and next week is week eight. So that's almost hard to believe. Who's counting, right? <laughs> Just because that's that's like um, that's like uh, the the easy way like for me to like know where we're supposed to be at at the class It's like I kind of know by like week number, you know, um, all that. All right. Anyhow, let me go and open this up. So, a couple of things to notice. Here's my application. And again, just to review, when I say application, I mean the place where the web config file lives. That's the easiest way to identify it. And it will also include all of your pages, both the ASPX and the, uh, the ASPX CS file. Um, this is where your app code file data goes. Um, or, I'm sorry, this, this is where your yeah, app code uh, folder goes, um, and that's where you put your custom classes. This is also where the app data folder goes, and the app data folder is a folder that is special for um, creating your databases. So if you make it somewhere else, move it into your app, create an app data folder and move your data into the app data folder, all right? 
You might have to hit refresh after you do that just to be sure that, um, that um, Visual Studio can find the file. All right, so you could create it on the desktop or, or anywhere, but it should be part of the app data file, uh, folder. All right, let's open up Visual Studio and open up this guy. I can navigate to that folder, open it up, If I created my app data folder and I moved my folder in there, I would want to hit refresh so it would see it. All right. Now, I'm going to go and create another page that has data from the table that we created. I think it was a contact table. So I'll go up to File, New, File. create a new web form. And this is where you could say I get just a teensy bit hypocritical. All right. We spent last week talking about master pages. And I uh, said that you probably should create a master page for like every page that you're going to do from now on. All right. Because we're going to build applications and we're going to build on those applications. So we're going to want our pages to look the same. So build a master page. I don't necessarily want to take the time to do that in my lectures. Uh, we've covered master pages. If you have, they're, they're pretty straightforward. If you have questions about them, fine, we can address them. But um, otherwise, I'm not going to take the time to do that. I'm just going to focus on um, the stuff that uh, deals with database interactivity largely for the next while. So I'm going to click Add. And remember to show data on a form. We're using the idea of binding. And the idea of binding is that we have our source of data and we have the way that we're going to display the data. So we can display the data a bunch of different ways. When I retrieve my contacts, for example, I can display them in a drop down if I want to, if, if that's what the situation requires. I could display them in a table. I could display them in a form. I could display them a lot of different ways. So the data that you're retrieving from the database is one thing. The way that you're going to display it is a second thing. All right? And then you bind those two things together. All right? You, you say that this visual control gets its data from this data source. So we actually did that with sitemap, right? With our sitemap uh, path and with our tree view. We could do it with the menu view as well. We created our sitemap data source in an XML file as our data. We can then bind that to a visual control, which means we don't have to retype the data on the visual control. The data will come from that data source. And it's the exact same thing with databases. Which then, if you update the database, you will update your web page. All right. So, in the case of, in the example that we're going over, we're going to have a grid view, which is simply a table of data, and we're going to have a SQL data source. Now, don't get confused and think that a SQL data source is only for Microsoft SQL Server. A SQL data source is for any relational database for which you have a SQL statement. So that would be Access, that would be Oracle, that would be any relational database. We're going to store the information 
information needed to connect to the database in our web config file. And that's called the connection string. There's actually a couple parts of the connection string. The advantage of that is we can make a change to it in one place and our entire application will be updated. So let's say we started out with a Microsoft Access database because our project was small. All right. We could create all our web pages using a Microsoft Access database and we could write our SQL statements to work for that. We could do everything for that database. At a certain point though, maybe, because Microsoft Access is not meant for larger applications, maybe Microsoft Access would no longer be big enough to do the job. So we might convert to a SQL Server database. The good news is, is that ideally, and again, there's always real world catches that could trip you up here or there, but ideally all you need to do is change a connection string in the web config file. And that will point to the new database. And everything else will, should work the same because SQL is a standard language. All right, is this is the language that Access uses, the same language that SQL Server uses, that Oracle uses. In fact, I essentially did that uh, on a project years ago. Years ago, I was working on a project, and when I was at work, I would connect to the Oracle test database. When I took my laptop home to work on it at home, at the time, Oracle couldn't run on a laptop. It was just too big of, a, of, a, of an application to run on a laptop, at least my laptop. So I just... I had a, a access version of the database, and I would simply switch connection strings depending where I was. If I was at work, I would use the Oracle connection string. If I was at home, I would use the access connection string. And the good news is you can also do that between test databases and production databases. Many organizations have test databases, right? Because they want to make sure the stuff works before they make it live. So they'll have a version of the database that's test data. All right. Well, you get your application working on that. To change it to use the actual real production database, it should just be a matter of changing the connection string. And we can see the connection string in the web config file. Ideally, you're going to have one connection string per database that you use in your application. Remember, you could actually have an application that uses a couple databases. It's certainly not unheard of. All right. And it's going to have the name connection string. The connection string actually, this part specifies that it's a Microsoft data, uh, that this is a Microsoft uh, database. This, this will work, but I'll show you how it should be in a minute here. Uh, it depends exactly how you make your database, how it words the connection string. And this gives a little bit of information about how to connect to the database as well. All right. So we run this. see our list from the database. That's not, a, that's not a valid path. Right. 
I didn't want to address this right now, but now's, I guess, the best time to address this. Notice what, notice what the path says, users BU205 desktop call center app data. That's where it's looking for my database. My file actually is in C users BU, not BU105. I don't know why that is, but it's different, right? It's different than how I originally created it. Well, that's a problem, right? Because, for example, when you do your work, you're going to have your username maybe embedded somewhere in that file path. And when I download it to run it on my machine, I'm not going to have the same folders that you do. All right? My users aren't going to be your usernames. My users are going to be my usernames. All right? So therefore, it's going to be looking for files under your directory structure when it isn't there. So let me show you how you fix that. And I think I made a mistake last time. I think that's part of the problem here. Let me Google something real quick. First of all, I called the app data folder wrong. I call it app data. App un yeah, I called it app data. It should be app underscore data. So let's correct that problem. I'll go rename that. All right, so that's problem number one that I did. It should be app underscore data. Second problem is, and I don't remember exactly how I created it, but you should never see a path that looks like this. C, users, the username, desktop. You shouldn't see all that because, again, that limits to where you can move the, 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 the database. You, you would have to keep the folders exactly the same. You should be able to put, whoops, Replace everything up to the database name with the pipe, which is a vertical line, and the words data directory. That still doesn't look right. Okay. By default, the data directory is going to be your app data folder. So now this should work. And let me test it. And it, it works. All right. Now it doesn't matter. I could take this, you could download this on your machine and have totally different directory structure. And, and because it's not looking for a specific directory, but it's looking simply for whatever has been defined as the application's data directory, this will work. All right? So the bottom line is, after you've created a connection string, go back and look at your web config file. The data source should look like this. You should not have an actual names of directories, but you should have the, the pipe, the vertical line, data directory, the, the second vertical line, and then the name of the database. All right. We'll go over this again, and we're going to create more examples of this, and, and, and uh, so you'll see how to do this. But you can always go and manually change it. Yes? Just to clarify. No. no. It is defined to look for the app data folder underneath your application. Oh, okay. 
So app underscore data. And I think that's where I went wrong last time. I just put in app data. I forgot the underscore. And that might have been what messed me up last time. All right. All right. Okay. So we already have our connection string, and we should be in good shape with that. We'll create a new connection string when we do our next example. But with my SQL data source now, I should only have one connection string per database. So I should not create a new connection string for this one. I should go to configure data source. I should click to use that connection string. And Visual Studio will stop working. Yay. Did the same thing last time, if I recall correctly. Almost exactly at the same point. Yes. SQL statement. So I can say select star from customer. Now we haven't gone over a lot of SQL statements yet. Select star simply means give me every column from the customer table. And since I have not limited which rows I want to see, I'll get every row. So this will be everything in that customer database. What order will it appear in? It will appear in whatever order the database feels like giving it to me in, which will probably be in primary key order, but you can't count on that. It might not be. All right. If I wanted to order it in a certain order, I could say order by and then order it. But we'll explore more SQL statements as we proceed on the next example. So I'll hit next. I can test my query. Finish. And now I have my data source that's configured to pull that data. I have to connect it to the grid view by selecting that data source. And now notice it shows the columns from that. Now I can edit those columns if I want because it's going to, by default, it's going to give me the names of the database columns. And depending how you name things in your database, that may be not real clear because a lot of times you use abbreviations and so on. So I could edit this. I could add a customer ID to say customer number. I could add a customer name to simply be name. And so on. I could get rid of things if I don't want to show them. Like maybe on this screen I don't necessarily want to show the zip code or something. I could, I could delete those things. Alright, and then it will look the way that I want. Um, you can, for example, enable sorting. That will make each column clickable, so that if you click on it, it will sort by that particular field. So you can sort by city, or you can sort by state, or zip, or whatever. You can also, if it's a large table, if there are hundreds of entries in this table, you could enable paging, which would allow you to only show maybe 10 rows from the, from the thing at the same time, 10 rows from the database at the same time. You know, like if you do a Google search, right? Could you imagine if you search for something and it showed every single 
search result on one page. You know, that page would never load. So they show you the first 20. Then they have a next page and a next page and so on where you can scroll through them. Well, uh, paging is like that too. So it'll work with when there's a large amount of data. So now when I run this, I should get my grid view populated from there. I can sort ascending or descending by customer number and so on. Now, if I go into the database, and I add something to that database, the next time someone asks for that page, they'll get the new data. All right? That, again, is, is the whole point of why, we're, why we are here, making our pages dynamic based on getting some information from a database. Could you imagine eBay? All right? eBay, when you place a bid, if yours is the highest bid, it gets saved in the database as the highest bid. All right? And then the very next person that gets that requests that page will see the new highest bid. All right? So I can go in here and I can add a new customer. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Pawnee, Pawn <laughs> Indiana. You need to add Leslie no post, otherwise one can't function without the other. Exactly. So I added it instantly. Whoops. I hit refresh. And there she is. She's added immediately. So again. This is live. This is database driven. So if there's if this was a, a you know if there was another application somewhere that hit the same database where new customers were added, as soon as a new customer was added, boom, it would appear in this listing. And that's really the, the whole benefit of this, right? Is that without having to go in and make any changes to our web page, if the data is changed, the results are going to be changed. All right, questions at this point. All right, that brings me to the example that we're going to play with for the next few weeks, or at least the next few classes. We'll see how it goes. If it's fun, we'll keep it up. If it's boring, we'll stop it. And we'll find one even more boring to make you appreciate <laughs> how, fun we'll the, go back to it. how fun the first example is. Yeah. Then you guys will be asking me, please, let's go back. And I'll, no, no, you found it boring. <laughs> Um, we're going to do an application for online polls, like where you can put a question in and you can have people log in and give their answer. All right? Now, any of you that watches America's Next Top Model, I think that's the right one. I get confused between those shows sometimes. But that's the one Tyra Banks is on, right? Uh, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. She sometimes tells the contestants that you got to fake it till you make it, right? That's good advice. And that's good advice for programmers, too. All right, what does that mean for programmers? I, I don't want to, I don't know what that means for models, so I'm not even going to try to answer it for models. But for programmers, what does that mean? What that means is this, that we do not have to build the entire application all at once. That we don't have to know how to do everything all at once. That with any application, with any problem that you're given, there's likely good to be going to be parts of it that you know pretty well, well, this is how I'm going to do it, right? And there's likely to be parts that, like, I don't even know where to begin on that, all right? The good news is, is there's ways of faking it where you can do part of the job, maybe the part of the job you know, without having to know how to do everything else. Well, now, the, the catch is, of course, is eventually you need to do it a bit at a time. 
and you can get you can do the things that you're unsure you that you're sure of rather and then later on you can focus on the things that you maybe you're not so sure on so for example in this application we have not seen any examples of how to add data to a database right we haven't seen a single one yeah we can still write part of this application without knowing that how are we going to do that we're going to fake it how are we going to fake it we're going to manually enter the data through access all right we've seen now granted it was a simple example but we've seen examples of how to view data from a database so yeah, that part, I won't say we have down, but at least we have an idea how to do that. So we can work on that part of the application while we're learning how to do the other part of the application, learning how to do inserts and updates and deletes and, and stuff like that. All right? So that's sort of the good news, and we're going to take that approach. I always try to emphasize this with all my classes, whether it be a, a simple programming assignment or a bigger project, not to try to conquer the world all at once, but to do little pieces at a time, get that going, then add the next piece. All right. The first step, though, of any sort of project, and if you're talking about, like, your project for this class, you know, the first step would be to plan out what you're going to have. All right. So that's what we're going to do. All right. Let me put some requirements up here. This application will work in two modes. You can be logged on or you can not be logged on. All right? So we're going to deal first with if you're not logged on. If you're not logged on, you should be able to see the questions. See a list of questions. And you should be able to see the current voting results. So, maybe the list of questions, maybe there's three questions. First question. And then next to it, you see maybe how many votes each one has. 
Kickstart, of course, has the most votes. So it has 18 votes. Monster has seven votes, and Red Bull has 12 votes. All right. Even this, we could build in pieces, right? We could build this page first, get it working. This page, I'll tell you what, isn't that much different than the page that we just finished a second ago, no. right? Then maybe we can add a link to link to this page and show the question and just show the list of possible answers, not even taking into account how many people voted for what. So we could do that second piece in a small bite. And then we could add on to it how many voted for each one. Yes? Well, they won't be literally changing in front of us. Okay. At least not, we could do something that was like with an Ajax thing where we refreshed it. But every time you hit refresh, it should show the updated number. Okay. All right. So you would have to refresh the page and ask the server again to retrieve from the database. But you're not going to see it moving if you just loaded that page and kept it there. Okay. All right. So you should be able to do that if you're not logged on. All right. If you are logged on, oh, you should also be able to create an account and log on. If you are logged on, you should be able to see questions. See current voting results. And vote on all the polls. So do we have to have like log out or something? Oh yeah, and log out. We should also say we should be able to edit our account. in as a user, we should be able to do those things. Log in as a user. Did I say log out as a user? Log in as a user. We should be able to do all those things. So, and again, you, you could actually combine them into one page or you can make separate pages. The voting page would look like, instead of showing the number, It could be a radio button, or it could be a drop down. All right. Now, there's going to be a third kind of person an admin. Because where are these questions going to come from? going to be an administrator is going to, going to, um, going to uh, be able to put them out there. So an administrator should be able to do everything a logged in user can. Maybe no voting because they could maybe trick They should be able to enter, update, and delete new questions and their options. All right. So maybe. You know, maybe today comes around and um, you want to ask a question about the Cleveland Indians. Do the Cleveland Indians stand a good chance at winning the World Series? Yes or no? All 
right? So we should be able to add that to the list because these questions we might not want to keep around forever, right? Um, after the 2016-2017 season is over and the Cavs have repeated, we probably don't need that question around anymore. I guess we could archive it, all right, uh, and keep it out there and, and not allow any voting. Or There's a number of things we could do, but we could just delete it then, just to not clutter our page. But we probably would want to put something in then. Maybe we create a new poll that said, well, the Cavs three-peat in 2017-2018. So, if I were to, if I was doing your project and this was my project, let's look at, at, at the, well, I, I won't pull it up because I want to leave the board up, but if you look at what you need to do for your project, the first thing you need to do is you need to um, you need to uh, write a little paragraph or two description of what your site's going to be about. So you could say my site website is going to be a polling site. We're going to um, allow administrators to enter questions and options and allow logged in users to vote and see results, allow unlogged in users to see the questions and see the results but not vote. All right, simple, straightforward. <clears throat> One of the things I asked for is for a list of pages that are going to be on your site. Well, if I clean that up a little bit, that would be the list of my pages, right? There'd be a login page, there'd be a log out page, there would be a list of questions page, there'd be a voting page, there'd be a voting results page. All right, maybe one or two other pages, maybe a home page or whatever. All right, so um, we would we would have that. All right. Um, there are certain requirements that you you need to to, to do. Uh, for example, you need to have uh, you need to be able to uh, insert, update, and delete. Well, we kind of addressed that with the administrator being able to insert, update, and delete questions. So we've met that requirement. There's a few other things about having a master page. Okay, we'll have a master page. Um, one of the things is to have a parameterized query. Now, we have not talked about what parameterized query is, but this app would have that. Essentially, a parameterized query is where you don't ask for everything in the database, but you just ask for certain things in the database. So this page would have a parameterized query because we would be pulling up not every single question, but just the one specific question and the options that relate to that one specific question. So there's going to be some parameter that we're going to give it to say, give me this question and give me the options for this question. And likewise, when we show the results, give me this question, show me the options, and show me what the voting has been. So I believe we've met those requirements as well. Now the next part of the design that is key, um, I think I asked for a mock-up of some pages. Well, we could go, uh, we could actually go and mock up in HTML. We could just make dummy HTML pages or whatever. We could actually mock up a page in Word or, or Photoshop or something. All right, so that's not that big of a deal. A big part of the design, though, is the database design. All right, and that's why I want to spend the rest of the time today talking about the database design. All right. I'm trying to think of how, how I want to approach this. Let's do it collectively. All right, make me earn my money today. I was going to have you guys break into groups, but... We'll talk about it as just one big group. Now, what's key in database design? Key in database design is, first of all, identifying the entities. All right? What are entities? Usually they're persons, places, or things. They're nouns. All right? Now, they may be like conceptual entities, like, for example, a poll is a thing, right? It's not a thing that you can 
hold in your hand, but it's, it's a thing conceptually. All right. Next thing you want to do is you want to define the relationships between entities. And again, entities typically have a relationship of either being one to many, one to one, or many to many. Now we haven't talked about many to many yet, but well, we, we will in this example. All right. Essentially, many to many relationships you can't have in a relational database. What you do is you break down a many to many relationship into two one to many relationships. And we'll see an example of how to do that. All right. So you define the entities, you define the relationships between those entities, and then you define uh, what attributes go where. Now, when you're done, you should have a database design. What would you do with that database design? I would look at the normalization rules and make sure that we have followed the normalization rules. That is, that we don't have repeating fields. Or we don't have um, data in one table that doesn't, data in a table that doesn't depend on the primary key. All right? So, after I have decided on the attributes and the keys and the foreign keys, I would look at it using the normalization rules and see, have I followed the normalization rules correctly? All right, let's start with the database design. And we might get, I don't know how far we'll get, we might, we might get through the whole thing, or at least through a good part of it. When I had, <laughs> I would say, as you see here, but what was there a minute ago, what entities are sort of implied? What are the, the pieces of this puzzle? Okay, there's definitely users. So that's one entity. And if you remember, we said that there are two kinds of users. There are admin users and there are regular users. Um, we could put those in separate tables, but we're not. We're going to just have one user table. All right? And we'll just leave that there. What else is in this problem? The questions. The questions. in this poll? They're both. They're both. And what else is in this application? In this, what other entities did we talk about? This one might be a little harder to think of. Percentage, no. Percentage can be calculated. Remember, it's a rule of databases. It sort of goes along with normalization. But if there's a field that can be derived from other data, you don't store it. So, for example, if I store all of, the student, all of a student's grades, I don't need to store their GPA because I can always calculate their GPA. And then there's no risk of having any inconsistencies. Their, so, their account? Well, their account information will be in the user table. The answers, right. In other words, if you remember, this getting, and I deliberately chose it this way, for energy drinks, there were three possibilities, right? Why is it good? Why would it make sense to define like three possibilities? Because if you had someone type it in, you know, they might make a spelling error, right? They might spell kickstart kick space start or kick start is one word and that would kind of muddy up your 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 data um 
So we're going to have a list of the options that they could pick. You know, that way, you know, are the Cavs going to repeat? Are you kidding? Of course they are. Yes. Yes, spelled Y-A-S-S-S-S, -S -S -S, exclamation point. Yes. Exactly. All those things, you know, would be very hard to categorize and group together and get an accurate, um, accurate answer to. But if you limit the choices, then it's going to be much easier. So we're going to have a list of... Pasta answers, or options, we could call them, whichever one you like. All right. What are the relationships between these entities? Question, what's the relationship between question and answers? Is there a relationship? Question oh. can have like more than one answer. All right. Question. One question could have many answers. A given answer really only belongs to one question, though, right? You know, kickstart's not going to be the answer to favorite energy drink and will the Cavs win in 2016, 2017, and what's your favorite kind of phone, and so on and so forth. Now remember, in database terms, only three numbers, really. Zero, one, and many. So you might say, well, there's three answers. We could list them here. Answer one, answer two, answer three. We don't want to do that. We want to create our own table. Because some things might have two answers, like calves win, yes or no. Other things might have three answers. Favorite energy drink. Other things, you know, what's your favorite uh, model of car? You could have a list of 15 options. All right? So is definitely more than one, all right? They're definitely more than zero, definitely more than one, so we don't care how many. There's many, all right? How do the rest of these things fit in? What else might there be a, uh, a, a relationship? Yes. The one to many for users and questions. One to many between users and questions. I can see why you'd say that, but I was going to say, let's think of it this way. What relationship does it have? Is there between user and question? The relationship is that a user voted in that question. All right. So in other words, if there were 10 questions up here and the user only voted on two of them, they have a relationship to two of those questions, but not the other eight. Why? What's the determining factor? The determining factor is they voted in that. So you're right in saying that there's a relationship between users and questions. That is what is called a derived relationship. In other words, if I want to know, if I want to know what questions a user is interested in, I will look to see the questions that they voted on. So I can derive that information from this table. All right. Okay, vote would go to answers. So, one answer can be on many votes. Thousands of people are going to vote for Kickstarter, right? A given vote has how many answers? One. You always have to do that when you're checking what's called the cardinality or the kind of relationship. You have to go in both directions. So, one question has how many answers? Many. One answer is for how many questions? It's just for one. One answer can be on many votes. A lot of people can choose the same answer, but one vote is only going to have one answer on it. One user can make many votes, but each vote is only for one user. All right? Now, question.
Is there a relationship between question and vote? Yeah, there is, right? You're voting on a particular question. Do we need to implement that relationship in the database? No. 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 Why not? Because that would create a circular thing, which isn't necessary. Yeah, because we could, another way to put that is that that is derivable. So if I want to see what question a vote pertains to, like if I have this vote and I want to see what question it's related to, this vote relates to this answer, this answer relates to this question. So I can go from vote to question by going through the answer. So if I picked kickstart, if my vote says for kickstart, I look at, well, then my vote was for kickstart. Kickstart was related to what question again? Oh yeah, what's your favorite energy drink? That's almost the exact same situation as you have between users and questions. Yes, there is a relationship. No, you will not implement that in the database because you can derive it another way. What's the issue with implementing it in the, in the database? Well, it's almost like a normalization issue in that you're storing, you could get things crossed up and have things inconsistent. You could have the wrong question ID on the vote. All right. And if you looked one way, it'd say they answered this question. If you looked the other way, it would say they answered some other question. So if, if you only implement things one time, then it can't be inconsistent. All right, what attributes do we have? What are we going to have in the user table? First of all, what are the primary keys of these tables going to be? User ID. All right, for user, it's going to be user ID. I'll tell you what, this is my default policy, all right? This is my default policy. Unless I have a good idea otherwise, I'm going to use a auto number key or a surrogate key or an auto increment key, whatever it's called in, depending on the database, as a primary key of each table. I'm going to use an ID, ID number that generates, all right? There are a couple catches to that, but for the most part, that's going to work out for you. So, questions, or it's going to have question ID, vote is going to have a vote ID, answer is going to have an answer ID. So we answered that. Where are, where are my foreign keys going to go? Someone, someone yell out a foreign key. Vote ID. Vote ID. Okay. So which field is going to be in which table? Vote ID would be in the user table. Vote ID is going to be in the user table. Does anyone disagree with that? the other way around, user ID in the vote table. Because remember, if I put a vote ID in the user table, I can only have one value for that vote ID. That means that that user could only vote, only place one vote. So, a simple rule of thumb is the many can point to the one. The one can't point to the many. So there's a one-to-many relationship between student and teacher in this classroom, right? One teacher has many students. Many students have one teacher. If I were to ask everyone in this room to point, every student in this room to point to the teacher, you could all do that. It would be stressful to see everyone pointing at me. All right. But every one of you could point to the one teacher. The one teacher, though, can't point to every student. How do I point to every student? Especially only using one finger. All right. Um, notice I didn't say for students to point to the teacher using only one finger. All right. I 
and I made the made sure I didn't say that. All right, but you get the idea. All right, so the many can point to the one. So the foreign keys are always going to have go in this direction. So the vote is going to have a user ID that points to the user that cast that vote. What other foreign keys do we have? Question ID in what table? In the answer. In the answer. I'll put the two asterisks next to the foreign keys. What else are we going to have? Answer ID in the book. We have the keys and we have the relationships to find. That's pretty good. Other attributes. Well, we just decide what we would want to store. Like, what would we want to store for a user? Maybe their email address. Maybe their first name and last name. Password. Password, thank you. And maybe their logon name. No, we're going to log on with their email address. All right. I love sites that make you log on with your email address because then I don't have to remember like what was my username for that site. So, because I always use a few, I always use a certain sort of username. And what happens if there's someone else that has that username? Then you have to modify it a little bit. Like so, maybe use your first initial last name. Well, what if there's someone that already has that? Then first. Then on this site, it's like, did I use middle initial? It's just a pain. Email address, we're going to log on with that. But we want a password. What do we want on the question table? Yeah, the actual question itself. So I'll say question text. Anything else? Well, we could get fancy with this, right? We could put, like, the date that it was created. We could put um, the date that it expires. You know, if we had a question, what, is, what do you think is the best uh, choice for Halloween costume? All right. Um, you know, we could have that expire on November 1st, right? November 1st, who cares what the best choice is for a Halloween costume? It's over. All right. We definitely need the question now. Um, answer. What would we put in there? Okay, you're right. But what would we call that comma? I guess what I'm getting at is, is there one answer in this table, or is there like answer one, answer two, answer three? Well, there can be multiple answers because there's a one-to-many relationship here. All right. So this would actually be just a single answer. And so, for example, what has the, what's the best energy drink? There would be three rows in this table. One for Monster, one for Kickstart, one for Red Bull. All right? There is only one tiny catch I see in this database design. I'll give anyone that can think of it a dollar if they can think of the same catch that I'm thinking of. And you have, let's see, it's 11.25, so we'll give you two minutes to think about a little bit of a catch. Okay, what? I think you need to make the question ID also 
Oh, the question in which table? In um, the answer. Actually, you don't. As long as you have it. All right. This actually isn't a flaw in the data. How do I say? This isn't a flaw in the columns and all that. It's it's an un it's a it's a potentially bad consequence of this database design. And bad might be an overstatement. policy that's not really a technical question I mean every single site that requires you to put an email on that so we have a winner <laughs> there you go congratulations the problem is is the way this database is defined right now a person could vote multiple times on a question all right because there's nothing that prevents that because this is a generated key. And we have a user ID and an answer ID. We could sort of, we could, I almost used a bad word, we could halfway, I'll rephrase my <laughs> statement, we could halfway take care of this by making this combination a unique index. But then one person could vote multiple times for different answers. So they could vote for Red Bull and Monster, all right? I'm going to say I don't care about that. Okay, this after all is not a scientific poll. If the person wants to sit there and vote six times, gee, I guess I'm happy they like my site that much. All right, we could talk about, and if we have time, maybe we'll implement some sort of control. Um, that would be some sort of server validation that we could perform. Before you place a vote, you could run out here and see if they've already voted. But the database doesn't do anything to prohibit that. Remember I had the word, what was the word that I had up on the, on the board at the beginning of class Tuesday? Constraints. Constraints. All right. Should have waited 30 seconds longer. I might have offered 50 cents for that one. All right. I won five bucks yesterday for answering a question on the board. I'm okay with you. Which, which class? Um, no, NORAD's um, C Sharp. Well, you see, NORAD is, must be richer than me. All yeah. right. Well, it's, it's only for the um, bookstore. Okay. Box, so. Oh, okay. All right. This actually came out of my pocket. All right. <laughs> he probably got that from someone. I think, right? I think he gave $10 last year. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. he said that Just throughout the year he gives certificates. Wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to step up my game is what you guys are saying. All right. <laughs> Constraints. Anyhow. Constraints are best implemented in the database. If you can implement constraints in the database, why is that? Because the database is the gatekeeper to the data. You cannot, if you have a constraint in the database, for example, question can't be blank, right? If you have that constraint in the database, then it doesn't matter who. Could be the database administrator, could be... Vladimir Putin, it doesn't matter. You cannot put a blank question in that database if that's a constraint defined in the database. It doesn't matter who it is, what powers they have, anything like that. Not all constraints are easily put in the database. I can't think of a simple way to solve the multiple vote problem. All right? And therefore, we're going to have to implement the constraint some other way. And we're going to have to implement that in our code, if, if it's important to us. If it's not important to us that they vote multiple times, then it's not a problem, right? We don't care. But if it does prove to be a problem, all right, um, then, um, then um, 
we would have to write code to implement that. And writing code is always not as good as implementing in the database because if someone else wrote, if you then went to a mobile application that used the same database that allowed people to vote on your polls, well, they'd have to get that constraint right in their code too. So you'd have to get it right on your ASP.NET web application. You have to get it right in your Android application. You have to get it right on your iPhone application. That's three chances to mess up, all right? Three chances not to do it right or to do it in an inconsistent manner, all right? So if it was put in the database, if all of them were updating the same database, then it wouldn't matter how you tried to update it. That constraint would be built into the database and nothing could put in invalid data, all right? But that's, this is one constraint that I can't think of an easy solution to implement. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to think about it and, and maybe we'll write code to solve this one later on. All right. What we're going to do next time is we're going to um, create this database and we're actually going to write some pages. And we'll do the simple ones first. Questions to, you know, again, if we go into the database and make up some data for these four tables, we can write the table that lists all the, or we can write the page that lists all the questions. We can write the page that lists the questions and shows me who vote, you know, what the number of votes are. We could even uh, write the vote page. It just won't work, right? And then later on, we can, as we learn how to do inserts, updates, deletes, and now we learn how to do other things, we can go and add that functionality into it. All right, any questions? Yes? What does it say in the question box? I can't read it Which one? Pretty much just all of them. <laughs> <laughs> question, it says question ID, question text, date created, and date expires. So I could put an expiration date to say that this question is only important through um, the end of the month, and then I wouldn't show it any time after that. All right? Other questions? All right. We'll see you in lab. <laughs>